If you could just close the poll when there's been a sort of adequate number of responses, I swear that'd be great. Of course, boss. Okay, lovely. So a bit of spread. So the answer to this one is Ramipril. Um, so basically, um, the reason why that you need to give Ramipril is because of this patient's diabetes. Um, increasing metformin, there's no point. His diabetes is well controlled, it says. So um, the amlodipine, so normally, yeah, you would probably prescribe this in this sort of uh, patient age. Uh, however, um, and the demographic, however, because he's got diabetes, the, the Ramipril offers some renal protection. Um, so that's why that's first line. Thiazide diuretics not used in step one, so it wouldn't have been that anyway. And he needs treatment um, because he's in stage one hypertension and he has a comorbidity. So we'll talk a bit about hypertension. It's one of those boring subjects, I know, and it's like one of those pathways you've just sort of got to learn. Um, but basically, the main relevance of hypertension lies in the fact that it's, it's an important risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease, um, such as stroke and um, ischemic heart disease. Um, but unless someone's presenting with extremely high blood pressure, um, they're usually asymptomatic. Um, so when you start getting malignant hypertension, like above 200 sort of range, they might get headaches, etc. cetera. Um, but normal blood pressure can vary quite wi uh, widely, dependent on a patient's age, gender, and their sort of individual physiology. But most healthy people tend to have a blood pressure between 90 over 60 to about 148 over 90. Um, patients who develop hypertension um, are split into two categories. Uh, the vast majority, around 90 to 95 percent, have primary or essential hypertension. Um, this is where there's no sort of single disease causing the rise in blood pressure, but it's just basically as you get older, uh, your body undergoes changes and you sort of um, just have some physiological um, complex changes that occur and subsequently cause your blood pressure to increase. But secondary hypertension, uh, this is where things might uh, subsequently cause it, like an endocrine condition or a renal issue. Um, I've mentioned some of those there in that table for you to have a look at. Um, but importantly, um, the main investigation, so I sort of learned this whilst I was on GP, um, but basically anyone sort of presenting to their GP with a raised blood pressure, um, they need to have ambulatory monitoring. So I think that's one of the important uh, things that you guys should know that uh, in order to diagnose it, they need to have ambulatory, um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring um, because of things like white coat syndrome. Um, but basically, yeah, you need to do a host of blood tests. Um, so things like lipids, um, um, you can do TFTs, LFTs, uh, but you mainly want to be sort of measuring the kidneys, using ease, checking if there's any um, end stage sort of uh, renal complications to uh, the other organ systems. Is there any underlying diabetes? So you can measure glucose, HbA1c. Um, there's also things that affect HbA1c, but um, things like sickle cell and um, um, other sort of coagulopathies, but we won't, won't talk about that too much today, but just things to sort of be aware of with HbA1c. Um, fundoscopy, important because you can get um, changes to the retina. Um, I wouldn't worry about that too much. It's more of a fifth year topic, what exactly happens, but just something to be aware of that you should do that. Um, urine dip, once again, ECG as well. Um, so urine dip could show... Um, sort of proteinuria um, due to end organ renal damage. ECG, um, so an ECG might show left ventricular hypertrophy and that would sort of indicate that this blood pressure has been high for quite a while. 
Um, the reason why I sort of mentioned fundoscopy and these sort of looking for organ damage is because if patients uh, present with a very high blood pressure and have subsequent end organ damage, you need to think about an urgent referral to hospital that same day. Um, so diagnosis, so NICE sort of updated these in 2019, um, classifying hypertension into, into stages uh, based on ambulatory, um, um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring. Um, as I mentioned, the, the white coat sort of syndrome is why um, we need to do this because it's, it's well, rec re well recognised that patients can have uh, an increase in blood pressure in a, in a clinical setting. Um, <clears throat> so basically, this has sort of led to that use of ambulatory blood pressure and home blood pressure monitoring to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension. Um, and they sort of allow for a more accurate assessment um, of the overall blood pressure and how it sort of changes throughout the day. And it can also help prevent the overdiagnosis. Um, you know, you don't want to necessarily treat someone uh, who doesn't have hypertension. The medications do have their side effects. Um, so I'm not too sure how relevant that uh, the process is to you guys. I don't know what UCL might ask, um, but they do recommend that you do uh, a blood pressure in both arms when considering a diagnosis of hypertension. Things like coarctation of the aorta, for example, uh, could cause difference as in the arms. Um, I wouldn't worry about that too much, just something to be aware of. Um, so it just sort of helps you um, identify uh, if there's another sort of underlying problem, like uh, valvular issues can cause differences in uh, arm blood pressure. Um, NICE also recommend that you take two doses in the same consultation. Um, and they say the lower reading of the two should determine the further management. Um, so any patient presenting to GP uh, with a blood pressure of 140 over 90 should be offered ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring. And as I mentioned um, earlier about the severe um, sort of very high blood pressure. Um, so if someone's presenting with above uh, equal to or greater than 180 over 110, immediate treatment should be considered. Um, and if there are signs of um, sort of retinal changes or palpedema, um, NICE recommend a same day assessment by a specialist. Um, so I think that's something important to highlight. Um, they could easily ask you a question about that. Um, someone coming in with a high blood pressure and they've got um, sort of uh, retinal ch uh, changes on fundoscopy, um, then you need to refer them straight away and you wouldn't go down that normal pathway. Um, they also recommend referral if you suspect a pheochromocytoma. Uh, Niche, I know, but if they've got sort of headache, palpitations, pallor, sweating, sort of uh, symptoms associated with that, they recommend immediate referral. But anyway, back to sort of the more normal uh, presentation. So if someone then has a subsequent ambulatory blood pressure of 135 over 85, this is stage one. Um, and you treat that if the patient is less than 80 years of uh, age and um, any of the following apply. So they have some target organ damage. They've got established cardiovascular disease already, renal disease, diabetes, or a 10 year uh, cardiovascular risk equivalent to 10% or greater. Um, they also said um, that you should consider antihypertensive drug treatment in addition to lifestyle advice for adults under 60 with stage one hypertension and estimated Q risk uh, below 10. Um, I wouldn't get too bogged down about the Q risk and um, whether or not you should and shouldn't treat and what the Q risk involves, etc. But basically, the Q risk just sort of um, says a Q risk over 10 is a 10% risk of cardiovascular event over the next 10 years. Um, and it also would indicate the treatment with statins as well, but we're just focusing on blood pressure here today. Um, but if you get a question on this, more than likely, the patient will probably need some treatment. And then um, if the ambulatory blood pressure comes back at 150, uh, over 95 or greater, 
then you offer drug treatment regardless of age. Um, and these are these are just taken from past med. They sort of summarize it quite nicely. Um, but anyway, this is the the sort of main thing that we'll talk about. I have a few questions on it first. Um, so what we'll do is we'll practice the questions and then I'll explain the slide. I think the best way to sort of do this is just practice. Um, so we'll do another SBA. Okay, interesting. Um, so I've just realized I've made a mistake with this question, so apologies. Um, in the stem, I changed it so he had heart failure. So I can understand why people put verapamil. Uh, my apologies there. Um, but basically, the, um, the correct answer to this question is that um, you introduce indapamide alongside uh, zinapril. Um, this is due to the fact that he's started on ramipril, so that's step one, and it's not being controlled. Um, and he's already on NACE inhibitor. So then you can either add a calcium channel blocker or a thiazide like diuretic. And as indapamide is a thiazide like diuretic, that is what you should add. Um, Lazartan is an ARB, so you don't combine uh, ARBs and ACEs, so that's the A in the pathway. Uh, Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker and it can be used in certain circumstances in the management of hypertension. But even though I didn't mention the history of heart failure in the stem, um, you would preferentially choose um, things like amlodipine. Uh, so indapamide in that respect is still better. Um, but as I mentioned, in, as I corrected uh, in this stem for the, for the second part, uh, verapamil should not be included um, in the management of patients with heart failure because it's a rate limiting calcium channel blocker and it can just make cal uh, can make heart failure worse. So that's something mm -hmm. to be aware of. Um, but what I'm getting at here is uh, this is the A plus um, uh, A plus uh, D side of the pathway. So practice another one. I will explain this again afterwards, don't worry. Okay, nice. So um, the correct answer to this is uh, the ARB, so kind of Sartan. Um, and basically why this is correct is because ARBs are preferred over ACE in Afro-Caribbean patients. Um, so for patients of Black African or Afro-Caribbean origin, taking a, a calcium channel blocker already, um, if they require a second agent, it is best to start them on a um, angiotensin receptor blocker in preference to an ACE inhibitor. 
Um, so that's why that's correct. I can sort of see why some people put Ramapril, but that's just a, an important little fact to remember. I'm making these questions a bit trickier on purpose. Okay, nice. Um, so the correct answer to this is in dapamide. The potassium being in there was a bit of a red herring. Um, oops. So basically, this is the sort of next step in the management. So he's on an ACE inhibitor. He's on a um, calcium channel blocker. So that's A plus C. And then the next step is to add whatever's not already been added. So in that case, the D, which is the endapamide. The spinalactone would then be added on additionally if he was already on those. Um, so we'll just talk about this now because I, I appreciate it's awful <laughs> and it's a bit con uh, confusing. I'd encourage you to sort of just take a bit of time in your in your on yourself to just sort of try and get your head around this. Um, but basically, step one: um, patients less than fifty-five years old or a background of type two diabetes should be given a ACE inhibitor um, or an ARB. But basically, you prefer ACE inhibitors because they offer this superior sort of renal protection. Angiotensin receptor blockers should be used when ACE inhibitors are not tolerated um, due to the fact that some patients develop a cough. Uh, patients uh, uh, 55 or over or of black African or Afro-Caribbean origin should get given a calcium channel blocker. This is because ACE inhibitors um, uh, have been proven to not work as well in uh, patients of that background, so that's why they're not used first line. Um, step two, so if a patient's already taken an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, you add either a calcium channel blocker or a thiazide-like diuretic. If they're already taking a calcium channel blocker, um, add ACE inhibitor or ARB or a thiazide-like diuretic, basically. Um, I, don't, for, I don't know the exact sort of guidance on this, I guess, in an SBA, there wouldn't be sort of like overlapping options. It would be a bit more clear cut. Um, but as I mentioned already, for patients of Black African or Africa Caribbean origin, taking a calcium channel blocker for hypertension, if they do require a second agent, then you, you would consider an uh, an ARB in preference to an ACE inhibitor and, and a thiazide-like diuretic. So it can either be A plus C, so ACE inhibitor, ARB plus calcium channel blocker, or ACE inhibitor slash ARB um, and thiazide uh, like diuretic or you can sort of see it for yourself I don't need to uh, read these out uh, but they're the combinations and then step three if they're already taking uh, A plus C then you add D if you're already taking A plus D then add C uh, so it becomes A plus C plus D and as I mentioned uh, step four is when you can add spironolactone um, this would be a bit more specialised and I don't know, I can't remember if they've ever asked us anything like that, um, but just something to be aware of. If they've got low potassium, you can give them spironolactone because it's uh, potassium sparing. If the potassium is a bit high, consider alpha or beta blocker. Um, I wouldn't worry about step four too much, uh, but that's basically the crux of it. Um, and we'll move on to a different topic.
Yep, nice, well done guys. Um, so chest echo is the correct answer. Um, so breaking down the stem, feeling faint and dizzy, he's lost consciousness on a couple of occasions, shortness of breath and chest pain, especially when exerting himself, he's got ejection systolic murmur. So this is sort of the classical presentation for aortic um, stenosis. So um, echocardiography is the primary test for the diagnosis, and it also allows you to evaluate the severity of it. Um, so there are sort of parameters about judging how severe it is. I wouldn't, I didn't particularly learn them. Um, you know, I don't think you'll get asked anything like that. It's quite specialist. Um, one thing I will mention whilst we're on the, the SBA sort of side of it, I think a question very similar to this came up in our fourth year. And also they like to ask about when do you treat um, uh, aortic stenosis? And more often than not, the answer they always like to pick is that it's symptomatic. So that's why I wouldn't worry necessarily about the exact um, definitions um, and how severe it can be judged on echo. Um, no one wants to learn those boring numbers. They're going to get interpreted for you anyway. Um, ECG in, in aortic stenosis can show evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. So you get um, increased QRS complex voltage and left axis deviation, etc. Um, but you can have that for other reasons. It's not specific enough for um, for um, aortic stenosis. Um, things like chest x-rays as well, they can be used. They can show evidence of cardiomegaly, cardi cardiomegaly and evidence of calcified aortic valve, um, but once again, not specific. Um, and then the exercise stress echo, um, they're more used in things like uh, acute coronary syndrome, but they can assess the severity of, a a uh, of asymptomatic patients. Um, and BMP is used in heart failure. So I move on to valve disease. <clears throat> I'm only going to talk about two, the most important two. Um, as we've mentioned, so aortic stenosis sort of has this triad heart, so you can get resultant heart failure, patients present with syncope or uh, loss of consciousness, and they get chest pains. Um, I'll talk briefly about syncope because it was one of the sort of um, main presentations and loss of consciousness history is quite common. Um, <clears throat> it can overlap with neuro as well. Um, with things like a seizure, for example, loss of consciousness. So it's important to sort of be aware of. Uh, but syncope is defined as a transient loss of consciousness, and that's caused by a sort of global cerebral hypoperfusion with a rapid onset, short duration, and it will sort of spontaneously um, recover, make a complete recovery. <clears throat> this definition excludes other causes of collapse, such as epilepsy, because that's a bit different. Uh, so syncope is not qu quite the same as a true loss of consciousness. Um, um, so the European Society of Cardiology um, gave some guidelines on the investigations and, man uh, and management of syncope. So um, you can get different types of so reflex syncope. This is sort of your vasovagal um, triggered by, uh, I don't know, some sort of a pleasant experience. Like I don't particularly like having blood taken. It makes me feel awful. It makes me feel a bit faint. Um, can happen in like big crowds. Um, can also happen when patients cough or go to the toilet. Um, orthostatic syncope, so things like orthostatic hypertension could cause it, but other diseases such as Parkinson's and Parkinson's syndrome, they cause autonomic failure, um, diabetes, like diabetic neuropathy, amyloid. Drug induced as well can also cause it and volume depletion. So if you've lost a lot of uh, blood or, or, or fluid, that can also contribute. And then your cardiac syncope, so things like arrhythmias, um, such as bradycardia or some AV conduction disorders. And then your structural, like I was talking about just now, so um, <clears throat> valvular issues or MIs, um, hyper, uh, Hockham can also cause it. Um, but reflex syncope is the most common. Um, although orthostatic and cardiac causes have become more common as the population sort of ages. Um, I wouldn't worry about it all too much, but um, 
it's quite common to see orthostatic hypotension. Um, so basically, if patients stop presenting with this, uh, you need to measure their their lying and standing blood pressure. Um, a symptomatic fall uh, in systolic blood pressure of greater than 20 or diastolic greater than 10 or decrease in systolic blood pressure below 90 is considered diagnostic for um, orthostatic hypertension. But anyway, we'll move on to aortic stenosis. Um, so as I mentioned, intervention is probably the most important thing. You guys probably uh, know the features and the causes and you can look at them in your own time but i think recognizing as is not difficult but what they like to ask about the intervention in aortic stenosis is indicated in the following sort of patient so all patients with symptomatic aortic stenosis that's something you need to know um, and then they talk about asymptomatic patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50 asymptomatic patients with a left uh, ventricular ejection fraction greater than 50 who are physically active and who have symptoms of falling blood pressure during exercise, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't get too bogged down on that. I didn't particularly learn it. I think the main thing to know is that if a patient's symptomatic, you need to treat them. Um, so choices of intervention are the TAVI or a surgical aortic valve replacement. Um, I wouldn't know too much about them and how they're done, but just know that a TAVI is favoured with patients with sort of severe comorbidities and, um, you know, have had previous heart surgery, they're frail, et cetera. And they tend to be older than 75 years of age. And then the surgical one is favored in, you know, lower risk sort of patients, uh, lower risk sort of patients. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't get too bogged down on the details and, um, Medical therapy can't really improve the outcome of aortic stenosis and they don't tend to use it unless the patient is very sort of frail, they're not suitable for either procedure and they have bad heart failure. So you give them things like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, diuretics, etc. Um, and then you can monitor patients with AS every six months. Um, I wouldn't get too bogged down on that either, that's a bit specialist. Um, but I think basically everything that I've sort of said and mentioned on the slides is all you sort of need to know. The other one that's quite common is uh, mitral regurge uh, or mitral insufficiency. So this is when the blood leaks back through the mitral valve uh, on systole. It's the second most common after aortic stenosis. Um, basically the regurgitation leads to less efficient heart as less blood is pumped through the body with each contraction. Um, but MR is common in otherwise healthy patients um, to a sort of trivial degree and might not necessarily need treatment. Um, but basically, as the degree of uh, regurgitation becomes more severe, the body's oxygen demand uh, exceeds what the heart can supply. And this sort of leads to, you know, your heart failure sort of picture, your myocardium can thicken over time. Um, so it's sort of benign initially. But um, patients may find themselves becoming increasingly fatigued uh, as the heart becomes less efficient and then they go into sort of irreversible heart failure. Um, one thing to be aware of is that mitral regurgitation can be acute and chronic. So acute mitral regurgitation is a cardiac emergency, um, can present with your sort of flash pulmonary edema, um, sudden onset hypertension and cardiogenic shock. Um, so things that cause that tend to be like ischemic uh, damage, um, you get papillary muscle rupture, secondary to myocardial infarction, and then non-ischemic non causes are like ruptured uh, cordy tendony, so I'll illustrate those in the picture there. And this can happen due to um, a number of causes like infective endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, trauma, um, sometimes they can just spontaneously rupture. Um, it's sort of helpful to think of chronic mitral regurgitation in terms of dysfunction of various parts of the valve. So I've mentioned cordy, tendony, papillary muscles. Um, I wouldn't sort of worry about that too much. Just know that there are two types and acute is, a, is, a, is an emergency. Um, there are a lot of things that can cause it. I think I've got it summarized on the next slide. Um, 
But basically, we've sort of spoken about this already, cause of mitral regurgitation, presentation, and then what you might expect to see on examination. Um, bit of advice for you guys when you're doing OSCE practice, because um, I imagine you guys are doing it the same format as us. Uh, so doing it on a healthy individual, and then they may give you some images or some sounds to listen to. So I really recommend um, listening to so practicing with each other, doing the examination, and then potentially getting some uh, heart sounds to listen to um, that can be really helpful. I think it helped me in finals as well, especially if you guys have got less time on the ward. Um, cool. So yeah, this is also a bit important. Diagnosis is made using echo, um, similar to AS, um, can help measure the severity and um, they assess the size and the pressure um, of the regurgitant jet. Um, if there's any structural complications, um, that's the main state of what uh, they use. But ECG, as I mentioned, um, can show changes. So P mitrophile, where the P wave uh, becomes broad and notched uh, because the left uh, atrial has become enlarged. Um, you also get right, right ventricular hypertrophy, right axis deviation. Chest X-ray may show evidence of pulmonary edema, um, left atrial enlargement um, due to the subsequent heart failure. Um, I will talk about AF later and heart failure later and their specific management. But the definitive management for mitral regurg is a valve repair. Um, obviously, you guys wouldn't be making that decision, but just something to be aware of. OK, so we'll move on to next question. Yeah, excellent. Well done. Sorry, the stem was a bit long, but I just want to sort of illustrate how MI can present quite differently sometimes. Um, so this would be um, sort of silent MI. She's not got any chest pain um, due to the fact that she's diabetic. Um, but the main thing is that the, the uh, ST segment elevation in leads V1 to V4. And as you quite rightly uh, spotted, this is a, a STEMI and she needs urgent PCI. Um, so aspirin and clopidogrel, all patients should receive this or some other variation like uh, ticagrelor, etc. if there are no contraindications. Don't need to repeat an ECG or do TROP because the STEMI already confirmed with the ECG. Thrombolysis, so that would be given if she had no access to PCI. And they sometimes give unfractionated heparin. Oh, do, do, do. Uh, please don't take control of the presentation, guys, sorry. Um, fine, and then unfractionated heparin, usually given to patients undergoing PCI anyway. Um, but the gold standard management is urgent PCI. So it's the same stem, just a different uh, question at the end.
excellent again well done guys um so yeah um second one's missing the statin beta blocker spiral and ace inhibitor would be management of heart failure as we've spoken about already ace inhibitors amlodipine and dapamide would be used for hypertension and then your statin gtn spray another calcium channel blocker and a beta blocker um management of stable angina excellent so we move on to acute coronary syndrome um so this is an umbrella term covering a number of acute presentation uh, of ischemic heart disease so you've got STEMI, NSTEMI, unstable angina um so this normally develops in patients who have ischemic heart disease either known or previously undetected um ischemic heart disease is synonymous with coronary heart disease and coronary artery disease like they get thrown around quite a lot but they're the same thing um i won't insult your intelligence with how that occurs i'm sure you guys all know about the narrowing of the arteries and uh, plaque rupture etc um so subtypes of acs um as i mentioned you've got unstable angina non-st elevation st elevation um basically myocardial infarction versus angina so myocardial infarction is caused by under perfusion of the the heart muscle leading to death of the myocardial tissue um and that distinguishes it from angina um by the death of this tissue um your risk factors so your non-modifiable ones are like things like age male sex family history and ethnicity and then your modifiable ones are your smoking um high blood pressure high cholesterol your weight um your diabetes management your, your stress that you've got in your life etc um so um myocardial infarction is generally categorized into two types so you've got STEMI caused by complete occlusion of a coronary artery um whereas NSTEMI is caused by severe but incomplete uh, stenosis or inclusion of the coronary artery um also um it's important to sort of be a remember that patients can experience this um this uh, acute coronary syndrome not due to a, a a blockage i saw a patient who had uh um NSTEMI due to anemia so lack of cardiac oxygenation um for other reasons so things like sepsis or hypotension i mentioned anemia um so it's i don't think you get asked about it um maybe i don't know but potentially just to be aware um i never even crossed my mind and then i saw it in basildon when i was doing my dgh placement um so diagnostic features of different types so um diagnosis depends on a combination of clinical uh, ecg and biochemical findings so unstable angina um would have cardiac chest pain um plus an abnormal or normal ecg but um the normal there'd be normal troponin whereas n stemi would have chest pain abnormal or a normal ecg but not st elevation but they would have a raised troponin uh whereas a stemi cardiac chest pain persistent st elevation or new left bundle branch block um and they don't need to have um a troponin in this case so st elevation on its own or new bundle branch block is enough um one thing as well to be aware of um the amount of st elevation that you need so st elevation uh in the chest leads um needs to be greater than 2 mm and st elevation in a in the limb leads has to be greater than 1 so i sort of remember that as the ones that are closer to the chest they're obviously going to pick it up easier so you need to have a greater amount of st elevation um and as we've mentioned new left bundle branch block um would raise a high suspicion of mi um diagnosis of nstemi requires two of the following so cardiac chest pain newly abnormal ecg which is not st elevation and a raised troponin with no reasonable explanation this table just sort of summarizes that what i've just basically said um so we'll move on to a bit of assessment of cardiac chest pain so um anginal pain is 
defined as the following basically so this constricting discomfort in the front of the chest that can go in the neck or shoulders or jaw or arms um, gets worse on physical exertion and it gets better um, with the use of GTN so if patients have all three um, then they have typical angina two of the above features they have atypical angina and if they have one or none of the above, then it's non-anginal chest pain. So that's something to be aware of. Um, and the immediate management of a suspected acute coronary syndrome um, in the GP setting would be GTN, aspirin, if not contraindicated, oxygen and ECG as soon as possible. But ideally, do not delay transfer to hospital. Um, so these are the sort of referral criteria. Um, you can sort of like go over them and learn them in your own time. Um, the investigations for sort of stable angina, um, so CT, coronary angiography, where they go in and look at the, the narrowing. Non-invasive functional imaging is second line. So I've seen questions where they put stress echo in there. Um, I think I fell for that trap um, and, and, and said that um, uh, as an answer, which is wrong, it's second line. Um, the, the best line, the best investigation is CT coronary angiography. Um, okay, brilliant. Probably the remit of what you guys need to know. Um, so we'll move on to angina itself. So as I mentioned, um, the features that need that to be there for stable angina, um, atypical angina, non-anginal pain. Um, so anti-anginal medication. So first line is your beta blocker. Calcium channel blockers, as I mentioned earlier, do not combine um, beta blockers with non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers um, because they can precipitate a complete heart block because things like verapamil and beta blockers going together will have a, a, um, a negative um, effect on the heart to reduce how much it beats and it can cause um, a heart block basically. Um, you can use calcium um, antagonist. So amlodipine is probably the best one. Uh, diltiazem as well is also used. Long-acting nitrates um, in a stepwise progression. Uh, so you'd start first line beta blocker, then you'd add a calcium channel blocker, then you can think about adding long-acting nitrates. Um, I wouldn't get too bogged down about the the ones later on. So um, I just added them there for completeness. I think knowing beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and nitrates would be enough. Um, and then revascularization. So this is when their optimal medical therapy is not working and you can give them sort of elective PCI. Um, I think you guys know about things like cabbage as well. I won't um, go into too much detail about that. But I'll talk about nitrate tolerance because that sort of gets thrown about a bit as well. So patients taking nitrates develop a tolerance to it and they experience reduced efficacy. Um, basically, they um, suggest that they take second dose basically after eight hours rather than 12 hours. Um, again, just something to be aware of. So we'll do a quick uh, clinical case. So I've, I've, I'll put the chat on the VBOX on. Um, so if I could just sort of get a bit of um, participation. Um, so a um, 76 year old man presents to a new severe left side of chest pain that radiates to his jaw that started an hour ago. Um, so thinking about taking a history from this, what sort of classical features would you expect to see um, in, a, in an MI? Just throw some in the chat. Crushing chest pain, yeah. Think about your Socrates as well. This might be useful. Radiation to jaw, acute onset, yeah, nice. Any sort of, yeah, sweating, nausea, I was just about to ask that. Any associated symptoms? Anything that might make it worse? Yeah, nice. Anything about the, the character of the pain, potentially? Okay, fine. We'll move on. So any classic symptoms, so I've mentioned that. Any atypical features, so I, I said um, 
MIs can pre uh, um, present differently. Yeah, abdo pain, yeah, good. Um, any unusual ways that MIs can present that you guys should be aware of? I briefly mentioned it earlier. Silent MI, yeah, so no pain. Um, yeah, nice, good. So definitely be aware of that. Um, good, good stuff. Um, they can also pre present breathless, breathless, brilliant. I was just about to say that. Um, and confusion as well. Um, so what investigations would you do for this patient? ECG, PCI is not uh, an investigation per se, that'd be the management. Bedside OBS, ECG, yeah, nice. Troponin, brilliant. So they're the main sort of two. So ECG and troponin. So any patient who may be suffering from an MI, um, the immediate investigations to do are ECG. So you're looking for ST elevation, left bundle branch block, or any other ST abnormalities. Um, this is the most important investigation, should not be delayed uh, for any other investigation because ultimately this can define the uh, uh, immediate management. Um, and if an ECG, you can get it done in real time. If it shows any sign of a STEMI, then you don't even need to bother doing a troponin. Um, they mentioned, so troponin, yeah, serial troponin is nice. Troponin should be performed at least three hours after the pain starts. It may also need to be repeated um, six to 12 after, six to 12 hours after the start of the pain. Um, you can measure like their renal function, blood glucose, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but guys, if you do ECG and troponin is fine. Um, they're the main two you need to know about. Um, so this is what um, you can see on an ECG. These are the coronary artery territories. <clears throat> I th this definitely comes up. Like I, I, there'll definitely be uh, an, an ECG in your SBA, potentially even in your OSCE. So I, I would sort of learn this. It will be super obvious though. They'd probably do an anterior one if anything. So check in V1, V2, V3, uh, V1, V2, V3, and V4. Okay, so um, let's say this patient has a STEMI. What would you do now? PCI, aspirin, yeah, nice, cloppy, good. Chicago, yeah, you can use them. I don't know, I, I'm sorry I've not really mentioned the other two. I just stuck to cloppy. Um, there are different parameters when you'd use them. I don't particularly know off the top of my head. But yeah, this is all well done. Yeah, uh, O2 morphine. Yeah, nice, good. So the treatment, uh, the mnemonic monac uh, can be used. Um, so you basically, um, you want to give them morphine, metacopramide, oxygen if their SATs are low. One thing to say about morphine, uh, that it's only sort of indicated if the patient reports severe pain very niche and I think you know I won't worry about it too much like ideally you'd probably give everyone it um, but yeah um, the monic uh, monac can be used to remember the initial treatment um, as I've mentioned they they use to um, uh, as well but I wouldn't get too bogged down the nuances of that um, and then yeah PCI um, so coronary intervention can be considered in patients if they present within 12 hours of symptom onset and within two hours of medical contact. Contact. They need to be hemodynamically stable. Um, patients who present within 12 hours of symptom onset but after two hours of medical contact can be offered thrombolysis provided they are stable and they have no contraindications. Um, if there are contraindications, then PCI can be done. But I wouldn't start getting too worried about all that. Um, they'll make it super easy for you. Um, but if the patient presents more than 12 hours of symptom onset, then pharma, uh, uh, pharma therapy is the only management of choice that you've got, um, provided that they're not um, severely uh, somatic, uh, symptomatic and they're stable. Otherwise, you can consider revascularization. Um, so um, things that are contraindications from thrombolysis in MI, um, I, I would be aware of the sort of contraindications. Um, so things like 
if they've had a GI bleed, um, if they've had recent surgery, if they've had a recent stroke, or they've got brain malignancy, severe hypertension. Um, so just things to be aware of. Uh, as I mentioned, so secondary prevention, you guys all knew that. Um, I won't sort of uh, lecture you on um, how to modify risk factors, you know, stop smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. You guys all knew that. Um, also, drive in one week after successful PCI, four weeks if unsuccessful. Um, cool, and then complications post MI, there's a list for you there should you need it. Um, okay. Okay, nice. Good stuff. Um, once again, wouldn't get too bogged down on that. I was trying to illustrate that this is heart failure, which you guys uh, recognized. And then they do like to bang on about this, that furosemide is just purely symptomatic uh, relief. Um, so just something to be aware of. I do think, I feel like it may have come up. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but it, it does seem to ring a bell in my mind. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, but we'll we'll talk about heart failure, and this is probably more pertinent to you guys now because you've got an OSCE, so this could come up. They could show you something like this. Um, so yeah, um, the sort of A B C D E rule of uh, a heart failure X ray, uh, chest X ray. So alveolar edema. Classically, this is perihilar bat wings, um, the bat wing shadowing that they mention. Um, Curly B lines are known as septal lines. Uh, these are uh, attributed to interstitial edema and um, the, the peripheral lymphatics just aren't able to drain um, the fluid. Cardiomegaly, so uh, cardiothoracic ratio greater than 50% on a PA film. Dilated prominent upper lobe, uh, upper lobe veins or upper lobe diversion. Um, fluid effusions, um, you can see them in the, in the the, the, where the costophrenic angles would be. Um, I've got a picture that sort of illustrates that a bit better for you, like a, a cartoon. Um, yeah, I would sort of pay attention to this sort of stuff. Um, it could come up. Um, I don't think heart failure came up in ASCII, but just something to be aware of if they ask you to interpret any imaging. And they do love these integrated stations now. Um, <clears throat> So we'll talk about heart failure, this is another big one. Um, so there are two types. So um, you've got your systolic failure, inability of the ventricle to contract normally. Um, this results in decreased cardiac output. Uh, ejection fraction is normally less than 40%. Um, things that cause it are like ischemic heart disease, uh, previous MI or a cardiomyopathy. Uh, diagnostic failure is the inability of the ventricle to relax properly and fill normally, um, causing um, um, uh, decreased filling pressures. Um, typically, the ejection fracture is ejection fraction is above fifty percent. Um, this is termed heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and the things that can cause that are like ventricular hypertrophy, uh, pericarditis, tamponade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I won't labour that too much. Um, 
left ventricular failure, so the symptoms are a bit different. So they get like dyspnea, poor exercise tolerance, fatigue, orthopnea, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, uh, dyspnea, and they get that nocturnal cough and they can cough up uh, pink or frothy white sort of sputum. Cardiac wheeze as well sometimes gets mentioned. Cold peripheries, weight loss. Um, whereas right ventricular failure <clears throat> would present um, with like peripheral edema, um, so things in like the, the legs, the swollen ankles, um, they might get ascites, nausea, um, facial engorgement, etc. Right ventricular uh, failure, the main cause for that is left ventricular failure, but things like pulmonary stenosis or lung disease such as COPD can cause it as well. Um, so these type, the different types of heart failure may occur independently or together and that's known as congestive cardiac failure. Um, acute heart failure is something to be aware of. Um, so um, it's often used exclusively to mean new onset acute or a, a decompensation of a chronic heart failure. Um, and that's when you get like the flash pulmonary edema um, and or peripheral edema. Um, and they can sometimes have signs of hypoperfusion as well. Um, I saw, I don't want to labor the sort of causes. I'm sure you guys are, you know, you know this. Um, but diagnosis and management is quite important. Um, so previously the first line investigation was um, determined by whether the patient has previously had an MI or, um, or not, but this is no longer the case. So they've moved to the, the NT, bro, the, the BMP basically is what, is what they look at. Um, and basically um, if levels are high, um, I don't particularly know what a high level is, um, I guess in the hundreds potentially. Um, but basically if the patient's presenting with, um, with heart failure, uh, and they've got a sort of, um, they, the classical symptoms, it's not been diagnosed and their BMP is like in the thousands, then um, you sort of arrange specialist assessment uh, within two weeks uh, and they need to get an echocardiogram. Um, but if the levels are raised, so I guess in the hundreds, like not quite the thousands, um, then you do echocardiogram within, within uh, six weeks. Um, just one thing to be aware of as well, um, ENP, excuse me, is a hormone produced by the left uh, ventricular myocardium in response to the strain. Um, but heart failure is not the the only cause of um, is not the only cause of a raised BNP. Um, so things like um, uh, chronic kidney disease, um, because there's reduced excretion, so that can cause a raised BNP as well. Um, also, patients on um, treatment with ACE inhibitors and ARBs and diuretics can have raised BMP. So just something to be to be aware of. Um, um, yep. So BMP can also be used in the prognosis. Um, it can guide treatment in patients with chronic heart failure. Effective treatment basically lowers uh, the BMP levels. Um, and the management we sort of alluded to already um, diuretics, you give loop diuretics to relieve symptoms, so things like furosemide. Um, you can also, um, what I think, oh, important to sort of monitor um, patients on furosemide. Uh, they can uh, get renal impairment, you need to monitor um, using ease that can cause hyperkalemia. Um, just things to be aware of. Um, and then ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, spiro you add them on sequentially. Um, I wouldn't be too, just know the treatments. I did, you know, realistically as an F1, F2, you're not going to be starting any patients on, you'd be prescribing them, but you wouldn't necessarily be making the decisions. Um, just be aware of the medications that the patients will be on. Okay, so, I mean, we've been going on for about an hour. Do you, do you guys want to take a break or just carry on? Quick break, yeah, that's fine. Um, sure, we've not got too much left. Uh, what time is it now? All right, shall we say 
three minute break is that enough oh uh carry on we'll just have a quick three minute break um i'll come back at 22. i could do going to the toilet to be fair so we're back in a second All right, hopefully you guys have had a chance to <clears throat> think about the SBA as well. Um, so we'll just move on um, to the next sort of topic. Um, if there's been enough responses, Shwet, we can close the poll um, or we can just give it a couple, a minute or two, just 30 seconds. Shall we close the poll? Cool, thanks. Okay, interesting. So yeah, this one is a tough one. Um, so um, basically, this woman has a, um, a background of thyroid toxic storm. Like she's got hyperthyroidism, and that sort of precipitated her AF. Um, but the correct answer to this is heparinized and DC cardioversion because she is in shock and she's sort of severely unwell so you need to you need to get that heart back into rhythm straight away um anticoagulate for three weeks and elective dc cardioversion so this would be correct if the patient wasn't hemodynamically unstable because she's she could have potentially been in af for quite a long time um flecainide is used for paroxysmal af the pill in the pocket and amiodarone is for pharmacological cardioversion. So I'm going to talk about AF in quite a bit of detail now um, and the management of it and the best way to sort of go about it. Uh, but AF, so this is something that you might see on an ECG, irregular spaces of the QRS complexes and lack of discernible sort of P waves. Um, they don't particularly, you know, so many things can cause AF, um, but basically the sort of um, the main issues are that cardiac output can drop um, as the uh, ventricles aren't um, adequately filmed by the atria because they're just contracting rapidly um, and also the risk of embolic stroke. Um, so um, we'll talk about the, the management and stuff now. Um, as I mentioned, like there's so many things that can cause it. 
the signs and symptoms I'm sure you guys are aware of. Um, I won't labor that point too much. You've got the information there. Um, but what I will do is the management. I'll talk about the management. So um, this is sort of how you should you guys should approach it. So there's five things you need to do to, or ask or uh, know. Is the patient hemodynamically stable? If they are stable, are there any reversible causes that are uh, resulting in it? So in the previous question, that lady had hypothyroidism. Um, if AF persists or has no reversible cause, do we wait rate or rhythm control? Does this patient need long-term anticoagulation? And would this patient benefit from ablation? So is the patient uh, hemodynamically stable? So if the patient um, has any signs of shock, so hypoperfusion, any syncope, any chest pain, uh, or any pulmonary edema, then uh, these are signs of instability and immediately DC cardiovert them. Um, this comes up 100%. Um, there'll be a patient presenting with AF. They will be in shock. You need to recognize it. And the answer will be immediate DC cardioversion. It's come up in fourth year and it's come up in our finals. Um, if they are stable, however, are there any reversible causes? So um, as I mentioned, anything can put a patient in AF. Um, so do they have an infection? Give them some antibiotics that might uh, subsequently uh, fix their AF. Similarly, if they're dehydrated, you can give them fluids, any abnormal electrolytes, replace them, um, endocrine abnormalities, sort them out, and it may reverse the AF. However, um, uh, the issue is um, this often is not the case. So you might have to consider rate versus rhythm control. Um, I've thought of about this and you wouldn't be expected to know or to choose between rate and rhythm control. Um, but the, the DC cardioverting thing is important. Um, so if someone's presenting, even if so, patients can present uh, stably, if they're quite young and their AF has um, been less than 48 hours, you can um, give them some heparin uh, to, to cover for any potential clots that might have formed, uh, sedate them and give them DC cardioversion. Um, if it's greater than 48 hours and, or you're unsure as to when it started, they need anticoagulation for at least three weeks prior to DC cardioversion. But you can do an echo there and then to rule out if there are any thrombuses that, that may have formed. Um, if not, then you can think about rate and rhythm control uh, with regards to drugs. So um, basically, um, the outcomes are similar between the two options. Um, there is some evidence that rate control has a better, uh, has a has lower risk uh, of stroke associated with it, but whatever. Um, rate control is generally more suitable in elderly patients um, and, though, um, and those who are more prone to drug interactions and the pro effects of anti-arrhythmic therapy. So things like flecainide, amiodarone are quite dirty drugs. I'm sure you're aware, um, you know, host of side effects and stuff. So you, don't, you, you want to attempt to avoid those in older patients. Um, <clears throat> so basically you just want to slow the heart rate down um and you want to try and keep it less than 100 beats per minute so um the main thing that they use is um a beta blocker commonly bisoprolol um it's a commonly used medication um just watch out uh, in patients with asthma um they it's technically contraindicated um there you go so that's the main one they use um so I think, yeah, and then the calcium channel blockers, um, they tend to use uh, the non-dihydropyridine ones, so the ones that I mentioned earlier that have um, this um, negative inotropic uh, effect. Um, so they slow the heart rate down, but just remember they're contraindicated in heart failure. Digoxin, um, I'm not sure how much this is used. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but they use that for patients who are um, who have a coexistent heart failure. Um, don't worry about it too much. Rhythm control, um, 
so this is favoured over rate control. If the AF is like paroxysmal, so that's why flecainide is an option there. Um, or if it's persistent and the patient's young and they're having bad symptoms from it, um, then you can consider uh, rhythm control. Um, amiodarone, I've mentioned, is um, got so many side effects. Um, liver damage, um, heart, uh, lung damage. Um, you can read about, read about them in your own time. Don't worry about uh, it too much. Just know what I've mentioned already. Immediate DC cardioversion if they're un very unwell. You can DC cardiovert in young uh, healthy patients. Uh, acute AF, you give them heparin, sedate them and do it. If it's over 48 hours, requires anticoagulation for at least a few weeks, you can do an echo to rule it out. And then you think about rate of control depending on their age, etc. Um, anticoagulation, I, I, I don't particularly remember this coming up, if I'm being honest. It may have done, maybe there's some of the other boys might correct me on this. Just something to be aware of. The CHADS VAS score is what they use. <clears throat> you can look at that in your own time. Same with the has bled. So that stratifies the bleeding risk. There is um, very little guidance about, uh, regarding this. So you wouldn't be expected to make this decision. It would be a consultant-led decision. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, once again, anticoagulation. Um, I don't think you guys would um, need to worry about ever making that choice. But just be aware that warfarin, it, that you can use DOAX, which I think they favour more now, low molecular weight heparin, um, just things to be aware of, like warfarin, you know, it requires monitoring, INRs can be affected by drugs and foods, etc. Um, DOAX don't require monitoring, a bit better than warfarin, you know, you don't have to go in for regular uh, checkups, etc. <clears throat> um, yeah, don't worry about that either in too much detail. Also, like, I, I keep saying don't worry about this in too much detail. I'm saying that, and I said this to the fifth years as well, this is the extent to what I learned the content, and um, I did, you know, perfectly well in my exams. I'm not trying to make it seem like it's easy or I'm trying to be lazy. I just This is just sort of what you need to know, basically, and I manage fine. Um, but if you have any more questions, just please email me and I can uh, answer them at the end. Um, atrial ablation, um, this is way out of our remit. Um, they do like weird scans and they can find out where exactly the focus is of, of the weird uh, electrical activity and they can ablate it and sometimes patients never get AF again. Okay, we'll move on. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> so the correct answer is new valvular regurgitation. So um, this also these stems are very long, and I, I've done it that way just to highlight how these things present. You, in your exams, they wouldn't be this long, um, but 
I'm just using these for sort of teaching purposes. So this is sort of um, classically, um, you know, the risk factors and the presentation of a um, uh, of an infective endocarditis. So the this is Duke's criteria basically. Um, so which of the following is a major diagnostic criteria? So new valvular, valvular regurgitation is IVD is a minor criteria, splinter hemorrhage is a minor criteria, positive blood culture of typical organisms associated with it, you need two of them, and fever is a minor criteria. Um, one little tip that I like to say, and I did it in my finals this year, um, is that if you get a, a chest examination, so a, a, a heart exam, and they give you, a, they will inevitably give you a murmur, um, and you're a bit stuck for what it might be or what might cause it. Two options that are never wrong are uh, infective endocarditis and rheumatic fever. They can cause any murmur. Well, they can affect, affect any valve and subsequently cause any murmur. Um, so it's just a little tip if you're ever stuck in an OSCE. Uh, just something to remember. Um, um, is there anything I want to particularly say? Um, it does come up in exams. Um, I think learning Duke's criteria is definitely uh, important. I, I, I seem to remember that coming up. And they do they do sort of ask about the management. I think there was a question on it. I might have been wrong, but um, I'll, I'll have to double check with the guys. Um, but I, I, I thought I put initial blind therapy down there for you. Um, I, I, um, I, I honestly don't know what to say. I, I think it's a, a tough question if they gave it to you. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, but definitely learn Duke's criteria. But also, I want to say Streptococcus bovis is associated with colorectal cancer. So uh, this definitely does come up. It's one of these stupid like niche UCL questions. There'll be a patient who's who's got a background of colorectal cancer or they may be presented with colorectal cancer and they've got infective endocarditis, what's the most common organ, uh, most likely associated organism, streptococcus bovis. Um, and I'd say that's probably the most high yield thing I can tell you about infective endocarditis. Um, but I'll leave you guys to sort of go over that and learn that in your own time. I'm just trying to highlight what you guys should go over. All right, we'll move on. Yeah, nice. Well done, guys. So you wouldn't get a question where it's been where it says which one of these is not associated. Uh, but this is just to highlight a learning point. Um, so this girl has uh, um, long QT, basically. Um, that's what I was trying to allude at here. And all the others are a cause. I think this is something that you guys should definitely know. It's quite important. Uh, propanol, propanol is used uh, in the treatment of long QT. Um, so that's why that's incorrect. I didn't know that in fourth year, so um, quite useful to know. Um, but yeah, classically, these antibiotics, so like erythromycin, clarithromycin, macrolides basically, cause long QT and things like SSRIs, so citalopram classically, uh, is a very common cause of long QT, so something to be aware of. Um, yeah, I, I'd sort of just be aware of what drugs can cause it, 
I've put this long QT1, long QT2, very like niche. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, but the main thing to know is um, Tossard de Poix. So um, I would be aware, get familiar with that ECG and know that the management is IV magnesium sulfate. Um, that's sort of the, the main thing that you guys need to know from long QT. What can cause it? Um, it's mainly drugs and the treatment if it develops into uh, TDP, so IV magnesium sulfate. So we'll talk a bit about heart blocks. I hated this. Um, so first degree heart block is caused by um, prolonged conduction of electrical activity through the AV node. Um, classically identified on ECG by uh, a long PR interval, so greater than 200 milli, uh, milliseconds. Um, so causes include things like high vagal tone, so um, athletes, um, acute inferior MI, electrolyte abnormalities, drugs, things like beta blockers, um, digoxin. Um, and this in itself is a, as a, a first degree heart block is benign, does not necessarily need treatment. Um, so second degree heart block or Mobitz type uh, one, Venkerback phenomenon, or Mobitz type one is a type of second degree heart block that is usually due to um, a reversible conduction block at the AV node. So this is the one where you get um, progressive lengthening of the PR interval um, which then results in a, in a P wave that uh, fails to conduct a QRS complex. Um, similarly, things like an inferior MI can cause this, the drugs, uh, high vagal tone. Generally, again, asymptomatic, does not require any specific management. Um, ECG monitoring may be required, but yeah, these two tend to be uh, not too serious. Um, so Mobitz type 2 uh, is a second degree AV block where there are intermittent non-conductive P waves. The PR interval is constant and there may um, and there may be no pattern or fixed ratio, well there may be a pattern or fixed ratio, so like a 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 block. Um, it is usually caused by a conduction system failure, so like the, the Hiss-Pakinji system a bit further down. Um, so this would cause uh, broad QRS, uh, QRS complexes indicating that the, the block is distal to the, the um, AV node and it's in the Purkinje system. Um, patients may have um, pre-existing left bundle batch block. Um, similarly again, infarction, but this one particularly anterior MI, which damages the bundle branches. Surgery can cause it. Um, your inflammatory slash autoimmune uh, conditions, so things like rheumatic heart disease, lupus, sclerosis, systemic sclerosis, uh, for example, um, and your medications again. Um, also things like infiltration, so like heredity, hemochromatosis, amyloid, uh, wouldn't get too bogged down on that. Um, but basically these patients need a permanent pacemaker as they are um, uh, a much higher risk than, mo than the other two at developing um, a complete heart block. And then third degree heart block or complete heart block occurs when atrial impulses fail to be conducted to the ventricles um, and then you subsequently might get sufficient cardiac. Um, you, you can still uh, maintain a sufficient cardiac output uh, due to these like ventricular uh, escape rhythms. Um, but uh, patients may present with syncope or cardiac arrest even, um, and they might have um, severe bradycardia on ECG changes on ECG, and you get this complete dissociation between the the P waves and the QRS complexes. Um, and once again, causes are myocardial infarction, drugs, um, idiopathic fibrosis as well of the of the fibers. These people um, require a permanent pacemaker due to the risk of like sudden death, basically. Okay, last SBA, we're nearly done.
Okay, well done, guys. Um, so periocardiocentesis, <clears throat> what I was getting at here is that this patient has um, tamponade, basically. Um, classically, you get raised JVP, dist the muffled heart sounds and, and uh, hypotension. Uh, so the periocardiocentesis is the management of that. Uh, that's basically all I sort of know about cardiac tamponade. Um, I've got a cheat sheet coming up in a minute, actually. So PCI is STEMI management. Fruzomide and high flow oxygen is your flash pulmonary edema management. So NSAIDs, um, management of like other sort of constrictive causes. So pericarditis, um, myocarditis. Adenosine is uh, the management of SVTs, which I've not spoken about. Um, but importantly, I would go over that in the... Uh, in the uh, um, Go on in the emergency section in the like Oxford handbook or on PassMed. So I've basically made this for you guys. I won't um, I won't talk about these in detail. I'll let you guys go over them. Like I was saying earlier, this is basically the extent of what I knew these topics as. I remember some lecture was going on about Hockham quite a lot. No idea why. Um, that genuinely, this is all you need to know for these cardiomyopathies. Um, yeah, so that basically concludes my presentation on cardio. Um, I hope um, that's given you a bit of a flavour as to sort of what level you need to know and what the most important things are. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, please just email me and please fill out the feedback form. I'm sure Ed. Ed potentially may send it, please, if that's all right. You're very welcome, everyone. Cool. Lovely. Right, I'm going to um, see myself out. Um, also, yeah, this has been recorded because quite a few people messaged me actually asking for it to be recorded.